afternoon, everyone. My name is Uriah Kim. As president of the Graduate Theological Union, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you here today. Although we cannot see all your faces in the Zoom room, we suddenly feel your presence. This is a truly momentous occasion for us. The work that we do here at the GTU, namely academically rigorous and profoundly relevant study of religion in a diverse and interreligious context has never been more important in our world. Today's lecture celebrates the endowment gift and the installation of Dr. Sam Shankoff as the Toby Family Chair in Jewish Studies. I could not be more thrilled that Sam will be the first faculty member to hold this position. Sam has already brought so many gifts to the GTU. In his short time here, he has contributed deeply to the breadth and diversity of our courses. And he has quickly become a rising star among our faculty in the broader academic world. This endowed chair secures this important faculty position at the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies. We are very proud of the work of CJS and its extraordinary blend of careful scholarship and public engagement. The Toby family chair will allow CJS to pursue its mission through the next 50 years and beyond training the next generation of Jewish scholars, leaders, and educators. I would like to offer my deep felt thanks to Toby Philanthropy for his decades long support for our program. Now I want to turn to Dr. Dina Aronoff, the director of our Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies. Mm -hmm. Dina. Thank you so much, Uriah. <clears throat> it's really wonderful to be here. I wish I could see uh, the Zoom room as it were, but welcome everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Uriah, for your greetings <clears throat> and for recognizing the role that Toby Philanthropies has played in the life of the GTU, its Center for Jewish Studies, and as well for those of you who may know the role that it has played in our new interreligious chaplaincy program, allowing us to launch it in a, in a way, uh, unparalleled way um, in a time of COVID. It is my honor to introduce Shana Penn, Executive Director of Toby Philanthropies, who will now offer greetings. Shana Penn is a person of extraordinary accomplishment. Her award-winning 2005 book, Solidarity Secret, provided a crucial account of the role that women played in the rise of an independent press in Poland and in the fall of that country's communist government. Shana also co-edited a 2009 volume titled Gender, Politics, and Everyday Life in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as numerous published essays. <clears throat> but in addition to her own scholarship, Shana has a long and unique relationship with us at the Graduate Theological Union. She participates in our life of scholarship as a scholar in residence. She serves as the president of the advisory committee for the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies, supporting its faculty and programs through her guidance and mentorship. Shana, thank you for the wisdom that you have shared so freely and generously with us. You are a model of scholarship, community leadership, as well as national and international cultural and political activism. I have learned so much from you as a mentor and friend. Shana. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Uriah and Dina for these wonderful, generous remarks and a welcome to me. I'm so thrilled to participate in the inaugural lecture by Dr. Sam Shankoff, the scholar, the first scholar to hold the Toby Family Chair in Jewish Studies at the GTU. And in fact, the first Toby Family Chair in Jewish Studies anywhere, ever. Um, and, and it's such yichus 
to be able to be introduced to and have the, the esteemed and awesome feminist theologian, Dr. Judith Plaskow, serve as the commentator for today's lecture. Um, I'm, I'm really, it's an honor to share the Zoom space with everyone, thank you. Academic Jewish studies is the anchor for all of the Jewish grant making that Toby Philanthropies does. And we've partnered with the GTU and its Center for Jewish Studies for, for about two decades. It's one of our longest standing relationships. We've always regarded the GTU as uniquely positioned in higher education, comprised of graduate de degree programs combined with divinity schools. It offers the pursuit of Jewish studies, a multi-religious and multicultural environment for teaching and learning and one that encourages justice, diversity, a care of the planet and bridge building. The GTU's mission and MO really debunks conventional notions of religion as rigid, outdated, uh, hierarchical and patriarchal. And I've always seen the GTU as a trailblazer in 21st century academic and re religious life. Speaking personally, as a visiting scholar at the GTU, I've been nourished and inspired by my relationships here. For Toby Philanthropies, the named chair in Jewish studies at the GTU is the pinnacle of our, of our support of the GTU to date. And we are very proud of this. We also recognize that there's always more to do. So Sam, mazel tov, thank you don't be a stranger. We welcome your ideas for programs. And of course, the ideas of that Uriah, Dina, and Kamal might bring to us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shana. Um, it is now my honor to introduce our speaker and respondent, uh, Sam Shonkoff and Judith Plasco. Dr. Judith Plasco is Professor Emerita in Religious Studies at Manhattan College and a renowned Jewish feminist theologian. I, I stand in a very personal debt to you, Dr. Plaskow, uh, for your pioneering work. Um, I'm just behind you uh, on the path. Dr. Plaskow is a founding figure of Jewish feminist thought. Indeed, her scholarship has demarcated the field of Jewish feminist studies, a field within which it's arguable now two or three generations of scholars are working. Her feminist critique of traditional Jewish materials, as well as the productive work that can be done within the preserved voices of alterity that are nevertheless canonized within them is a model for scholars in any number of fields. Dr. Plaskow is co-founder and for many years co-editor of the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion. Her work standing again at Sinai, Judaism from a Feminist Perspective is the foundational text in the field. Her other works include The Coming of Lilith, Essays on Feminism, Judaism and Sexual Ethics. Her latest book, Goddess and God in the World, Conversations in Embodied Theology is co-authored with Carol P. Christ. We are so honored, Judith, to have you and that you will be offering a response today. I will now also introduce our featured speaker, <clears throat> Sam Shonkoff. I have been lucky enough to be Sam's colleague here at the GTU for two approaching three years. And I could say many things about Sam, but I will limit my remarks to one quality in particular. As a scholar, I believe that Sam embodies a rare combination of diligence and access. His current book project investigates themes of embodiment in Martin Buber's representations of Hasidism, especially with a close eye upon how Buber worked with the original Hasidic sources. For this project, Sam has examined archival materials working in the German, in manuscripts, with classical Hebrew and Aramaic Hasidic materials, all in order to recast a figure of no less stature than Martin Buber. At the same time, while plumbing the depths of the archives, Sam co-edited with Ariel Evan Mays a anthology of Hasidic texts in translation, Hasidism, 
writings on devotion, community, and life in the modern world, thereby translating those very same materials into a form that provides access for those not trained in the classical languages and rhetoric. This combined commitment to scholarly research and effective communication, I think of as one of Sam's unique and particular strengths. Sam is also insistent upon the importance of contemporary perspectives upon the Jewish past. He brought this to the fore in his edited volume, Martin Buber, His Intellectual and Scholarly Legacy, an astounding set of essays by current intellectuals on the legacy of Martin Buber. Sam invests his intellect in the Jewish past with an insistence upon their implications in our present. I know that we are in for a treat today with his lecture. Now, for those of you that are here, just to share with you how this will go, Sam will offer a lecture um, followed by Judith's response. And after some conversation between our two speakers, I will turn to you, our participants, for questions that we might pose to our speakers. So I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A and I will do my best to curate your questions and bring them uh, to our speakers. And we look forward to the discussion. Sam Shankoff. Dina, my friend and colleague, thank you. Uriah and Shana, Toby Philanthropies. Um, I am so honored and Judith Plaskow, it is, I am honored and I am humbled that you are joining us today. And that is a beautiful combination of feelings. <laughs> I've been, um, just wanna thank you in advance for your response. I've been studying your writings and teaching your writings for years. And this is just an incredible, incredible gift. Um, and hello to all of you out there, I really, uh, look forward to your questions. And um, as Uriah said, I can't see you, but I feel your presence. So thank you so much for being here. Um, for, this, for this occasion, I want to share material from that book project, that, that the current book project that Dina just mentioned. As a whole, the book is on Martin Buber's representations of Hasidism a Jewish mystical movement that erupted in 18th century Poland and spread like wildfire therefrom. Buber, that so-called towering figure of German Jewish thought was actually born in Vienna in 1878 and spent most of his childhood in the Polish heartland before moving to Germany only in his university years. Ultimately, despite his own religious anarchism, Buber did more than any other person in history to introduce Hasidism to the non-Hasidic world. Over the course of a half century, Buber transformed Hebrew and Yiddish Hasidic texts into some 1500 German tales, which he published for broad audiences. I say transformed instead of translated because his renditions were faithful, not so much to verbatim language as to what he considered to be the inner meaning of the words. In effect, Buber refracted Hasidic sources through the prism of his own religious mind. And this is where I hope to show in my work that matters actually get most interesting. As an incisive and creative interpreter of those texts, Buber's readings reflect at once the hermeneutical possibilities within Hasidism and his own theological ethical lens. Drawing upon Buber's unpublished notebooks and the Hasidic volumes in his library, my own work offers an intertextual study of Buber's tales. And as Dina mentioned, thematically, I focus on themes of embodiment in those writings. Hasidism itself is known for its tendencies to bend the otherworldly elements of medieval Kabbalah down to the earth, as it were. Hasidic concepts of worship in corporeality and a universe soaked in divine presence, along with that movement's radical emphases on community, song, and dance, proved most flammable for Buber's theological imagination. 
In his anthologies, he isolated and amplified those elements to express what I call his embodied theology. Although Buber bristled at questions of theological belief, he sensed that concrete relational events in the world reveal divinity to human awareness in unspeakable ways. There is no objective theological knowledge. There is only intersubjective knowing, irreducible to any static dogma that one could profess or possess thereafter. Fleshly presence itself, where beings face one another is the very medium of Buber's embodied theology. And his Hasidic tales, often just simple stories about human interactions, capture this non-doctrinal dynamism in ways that no abstract discourse possibly could. So my book follows the paper trails of Buber's neo-Hasidism in order to trace the contours of his embodied theology. And yet, <laughs> reflections on embodiment can threaten to distract us from bodies. And I'll just say admittedly that um, at times myself deep in library stacks or in my own head, I've been acutely aware of this pitfall. Feminist theologians in particular have highlighted this hazard. In the words of Lisa Isherwood and Elizabeth Stewart, what must be guarded against at all costs is the disappearance of the real, lived, laughing, suffering, birthing, and dying body underneath the philosophical and theological meaning it is called to bear. It would indeed be foolish to allow the body to become a disembodied entity, end quote. Moreover, Black womanist theologians have emphasized especially that all bodies are also socially situated bodies, praised and persecuted, aggrandized and marginalized, racialized and gendered. In our investigations of Buber's embodied theology then, we have to ask whose bodies are present in his Hasidic tales and whose are absent. Hasidism itself has been one of the most gender segregated movements in Jewish history. How did Buber navigate that textual terrain? How are men and women revealed and concealed in his narratives compared to the original Hasidic sources themselves? Finally, what happens when we read Buber's embodied theology through the lens of gender? especially considering how corporeality itself was so often feminized in Jewish mysticism and the Western philosophical tradition alike. Now, I want to say from the outset that Buber's navigations of sex and gender in his Hasidic writings lead us into thorny territory. As best as I can, given both my scholarly toolkit and my particular positionality as a scholar of Hasidism and German Jewish culture, as a cis man steeped in male privilege since the day I was born, if not before, as a feminist, as a student of students of Buber's students who is both immersed in that intellectual stream and also critically engaged therewith, I will try to present gender in Buber's Hasidic tales with utmost true to life complexity. All errors and blind spots are my own and prayerfully my growth edges. In short, what I wanna show today is that while on one hand, Buber's representations of Hasidism were indeed gender bending in various ways and we can locate textual traces of his own personal distaste for Hasidic misogyny. On the other hand, we see that his very efforts to revise those sexist elements usually did little more than just reconfigure patriarchal hegemony. Ultimately, Buber's hermeneutical activism rendered women even less visible in his Hasidic tales than they were in the original sources. 
And moreover, his anthologies inspired sugarcoating tendencies in neo-Hasidism that persist to this day. I just want to note this term neo-Hasidism, I'll be continuing to use that, and that basically refers to non-Hasidic Jews, so Jews who are not sociologically within the orbit of, of Hasidism, who are nonetheless drawing upon Hasidic sources, Hasidic aesthetics and values for purposes of spiritual cultural renewal. Now, my, my goal in sharing this material is not necessarily to discourage anyone here from turning to Buber Hasidism or Neo Hasidism for spiritual enrichment, although that is needless to say your prerogative. Rather, my primary goal is to foster a genuine encounter with this material. Just as in interpersonal relationships, so too in religious studies and religious life, intimacy demands that we open our eyes, not to some saccharine projection, but to the textured reality of otherness. Whether in the love of a person or a people, a tradition or a country, dishonest romanticizing is not only shallow, but I believe dangerous. In turning now to gender in Buber's anthologies, it's fitting for us to begin with a tale of sorts. The following is an anecdote penned by the German Jewish scholar Ernst Simon about a Hasidism seminar that Buber taught at the Frankfurt Lehrhaus in 1923. The audience for Simon's misogynistic narration was none other than Martin Buber himself. Indeed, this was a personal letter of complaint. And I quote at length here. You asked the group there, a chance association of people to truly speak their minds so that for once a seminar would accomplish more than the usual thing so that there could be a little mutual advising and helping. In response, there developed a partly hysterical, partly shameless barrage of questions typically carried on almost exclusively by females, which profoundly repelled not only me, but also a large number of both younger and older people and offended a very sensitive core of their selves." End quote. I have to be like very careful to say, to make it known when I'm quoting here, this is in Simone's voice. Simone does grant Buber some masculinist assurance, quote, you heroically held your own like a fencer, preserved the boundaries even in the face of the most brazen questioner, end quote. But his frustration hits a boiling point when Buber prevents him from steering the seminar away from feminine hysterics toward, quote, things of true and lasting value, such as theories of Jewish law. Quote, you did not take my hand when I held it out to save you from the assault of hysteria and mendacity, Simone writes. Quote, and then the psychological slopping around resumed. This exceedingly repugnant scene from the expression on your face, rarely a flicker of irony, mostly a kindly smile. It was apparent that you did not feel the full force of what was going on there, end quote. Simone contends that this pedagogical mayhem was symptomatic of Buber's broader metaphysical viewpoint, which leaves no room for it, the tragic aspect of life. Buber's notions of divine immediacy and interpersonal intimacy fail to account for the fall from Eden, Simone suggests, through which, quote, we know shame and thus the tragic aspect of sex, end quote among other fraught elements of bodily existence. Thus, Simone continues, quote, this is what shook me recently at the Hasidism seminar. You thought you were standing naked before God, but were standing naked before Mrs. H, a terrible sight. So one of the many, many things that Simone fails to grasp here was that the pedagogy that day aligned with Buber's own understanding of the material at hand. 
Hasidism for Buber was not so much a constellation of concepts or ideas as much as a way of being in relationship and community. In his famous formulation, Hasidism is the Kabbalah become ethos. The integration of mutual advising and helping in the seminar resonated with the course content as far as the instructor was concerned. And interestingly, in this case at least, we see that Simone's hostility toward women was bound up with his resistance to Buber's conception of Hasidism. So we can ask, was there indeed something feminine about Buber's approach to Hasidism? If we ask that question with essentialist definitions of masculine and feminine in mind, definitions that were familiar to German Jews and Polish Hasidim alike in Buber's lifetime, then the answer may be yes. As the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, Tzipi Kaufmann notes, close attention reveals that neo-Hasidism is focused mainly on feminine aspects of Hasidism. And quote, when Martin Buber glorifies the Hasidic story, presence in the moment and engagement in this world, or to express it in very general terms, the feminine aspects of Hasidism, this did indeed produce a gendered discourse. Regardless of his intentions, and that's important, <laughs> regardless of his intentions, Buber's well-known prioritization of the mices over the drushes, the tales over the homiletical or theoretical literature of Hasidism was rather gender bending, in fact. Not only did women show up more in the tales than in the sermons, but historically by design, Hasidic tales were far more accessible to female readers than the sermons were. In the words of Ada Rappaport Albert, it was much more likely that women read the tales which were spoken widely and often printed in Yiddish than the homilies, which were delivered orally to an exclusively male audience by the exclusively male leaders of the movement. Once in print, always in Hebrew, they remained virtually inaccessible to the women. That's Ada Rappaport Albert. Moreover, theologically, Hasidic sages consistently identified storytelling with women and exegesis with men. According to the very first books of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov himself, the so-called founder of Hasidism, commenting on the verse from Ecclesiastes, Re'eh Hayim Im Isha, see life with the woman. The Besht instructed his disciples, even with woman, that is, with stories, conversations, and bodily matters, you can see life, meaning you can elevate those moments to the level of masculine spiritual consciousness. Such sublimation is possible, the Besht clarifies, because all stories are made of the letters of the Aleph Bet, the very primordial units of Torah and creation itself. Through contemplation of the letters, one spiritualizes and thus masculinizes the feminine materiality of narrative. But this is far afield from Buber, who celebrated Hasidic stories precisely as irreducible portraits of embodied religiosity in Hasidism. Buber explicitly sought to recapture the full-bodied orality of the tales, quote, ass always assisted by tone and gesture, as opposed to some spiritualized essence. In other words, he embraced a historically feminized genre of Hasidic literature without seeking to masculinize it. And I just wanna make really clear, we can make this observation without necessarily attributing any feminist intentions whatsoever to Buber in this process. From this perspective, we might offer a gendered rereading of the famous controversy between Buber and Gershom Sholom about the true nature of Hasidism. Indeed, their debate hinged primarily on the question of whether the masculine homilies or the feminine tales constituted the movement's essential literature. 
And it's noteworthy that Sholem himself derided on Buber on at least a few occasions for being feminine or otherwise emasculated, accusations that followed Buber throughout his life. Avoiding any reductionism, we can at least bear such sexist statements in mind when considering Sholem's insistence, say, that Buber was too quick to affirm the relational bodily dimensions of Hasidism at the expense of the movement's intellectual theoretical dynamics. Such a gendered rereading of the buber sholem debate sheds an altogether new light on Sholem's insistence, for example, that Buber failed to appreciate the difference between sophisticated Hasidic theology and theory on the one hand, and merely popular or vulgar praxis on the other. That's Sholem's language. We might also direct a more critical gaze towards Sholem's claim that, quote, the legends should by no means seduce us into thinking that they represent the real doctrines, which only a real and scholarly understanding could illuminate. But let us not get ahead of ourselves. After all, Buber's tales of the Hasidim, his, his ultimate anthology um, in his Hasidic writings, Buber's Tales of the Hasidim contains 51 chapters, all of which are named after male tzaddikim, Hasidic leaders. Has Hasidism itself has been one of, if not the most male-centered movements in Jewish religious history. Moreover, we're talking about a guy who gave no public credit whatsoever to his wife, Paula Winkler Buber, after she herself wrote some of the tales for at least one of his early Hasidic anthologies. Ultimately, to read for gender in Buber's tales is not to suggest that his representation of Hasidism was somehow feminine, let alone feminist. For our purposes, it's more illuminating rather to conduct direct investigations of gender dynamics in his tales, paying special attention to the intertextual interplay between Hasidic sources and Buber's renditions thereof. And as we observe what arises at this hermeneutical intersection, we ought to track two different planes of representation, the theological and the cultural. So we've already shed some light on the gendered theological dynamics at play. As we've seen, given the nature of Hasidic theology, the issue in this case of theology, if, it, if that can be extracted from culture, which I'm just doing for heuristic purposes right now, <laughs> um, that in theology, this case is less about flesh and blood social beings, men and women, than about cosmic spiritual principles, the masculine and the feminine. Although, of course, we should entertain no illusions that the latter functioned tidally independently of the former. Still, we might note Buber's consistent efforts in his representations of Hasidic sources to accentuate and at times outright impose injections of spirituality into corporeality, as opposed to the reverse of abstracting spirituality from corporeality. Buber's emphasis on spiritual descent rather than ascent, to use the mystical terminology, has profound gender implications. Or we might consider, for example, Buber's navigation of, histor of um, Hasidic representations of Malka Rokeach, the wife of Shalom Rokeach, the first Belzer Rebbe. In the traditional literature, Malka was revered as a tzaddeket, the, the feminine form of tzaddik, of the Hasidic leaders, so that's significant. And one collection goes so far as to assert that it was through her that the Belzer Rebbe attained his greatness. There were a number of tales in which Hasidim are shocked at the public visibility of Malka with her husband Shalom. Yet there is a glowing apologetic refrain that this couple was, quote, like Adam and Eve before the sin. Now, in that Hasidic context, this statement that they're like Adam and Eve before the sin um, tended to dissolve 
rather than affirm Malka's presence. There, Rabbi Shalom is likened to Adam Harishon, the first Adam, who according to Kabbalah was a perfect unity of masculinity and femininity before the cosmic rupture that produced a separate female existence, severed from androgynous divinity, which in this Kabbalistic system is essentially male. Indeed, Rabbi Shalom himself reportedly suggested that he was at such a high spiritual level that he felt no physical sensations whatsoever in his encounters with Malka, even when simply sitting beside her. In effect, he dissolved her individuated presence within himself, attaining what Elliot Wolfson describes as Kabbalah's ideal state, wherein gender differentiation is neutralized and the female is absorbed back into the male. Tellingly, Buber did not even mark that latter anecdote in his personal notes on the Belzer Rebbe, although it's clear that he read it. And just to, so you can see what I'm seeing when I'm doing this research. Um, so this is Buber's personal notes from the archive. We see, okay, these are his notes on Shalom of Belz of Belts, the, the Rebbe whom we're talking about. And we see, okay, he's reading Dover Shalom. That's the anthology that that kind of gross tale I was just talking about comes from. And we see he marks the tales he likes. We see page seven, page eight, page nine, page 20. This is the one that he likes, uh, like Adam and Eve before the sin goes on 23. The tale I was just talking about is on page 31, 32. And we just like, we can, we can see like the smoking gun evidence. Okay, he didn't like that one, right? <laughs> he did not record that one in his notes, skip it. Buber did make sure to anth anthologize a different tale that compares Shalom and Malka to Adam and Eve before the sin, as you just saw in his notebook. But for him, that phrase had nothing to do with dissolving feminine materiality into masculine spirituality. On the contrary, after lamenting in his introduction to Tales of the Hasidim that the fall from Eden has led many Jewish pietists to dismiss female presence as a, quote, distraction, Buber claims that this is precisely what Shalom Rokeach overcame. And I'm quoting Buber here. We see, we see him sitting with his wife like Adam and Eve in paradise before the sin, when the woman, in her whole being, Ihren Gansen Wesen, was still the man's helpmate. The original state of creation is restored in this relationship between Shalom and Malka in Buber's imagination. Thus, for Buber, the comparison to Adam and Eve before the sin does not mitigate Malka's presence, but rather magnifies it. Indeed, we know from Buber's other writings that he regarded the biblical formulation and Adam knew his wife as an expression of I thou encounter, wherein the other is supremely present. Just as a side note, evidently Ernst Simone was not wrong then when he accused Buber earlier of trying to restore a dialogical immediacy that was lost at the tree of knowledge. And yet, unlike the original Hasidic sources, which named Malka and called her at Sadeket, Buber never even mentions Malka by name. Moreover, we have to note that in his general efforts to soften or omit Hasidism's gendered hierarchy of spirituality over materiality, Buber actually makes the divine feminine, the Shekhinah, even less prominent than she was in the original Hasidic sources. On some level then, the absorption of, feminine, of femininity into masculine neutrality remains active in Buber's works, even while he subverts the hierarchy to favor the lower, formerly feminine dimension. A related dynamic comes into focus when we read for gender in Buber's representations of Hasidic culture as opposed to theology. 
And here it's worth just dwelling for a moment on Buber's own historical context. As Benjamin Maria Bader points out, throughout the 19th century, that is in the generations leading up to Buber's Hasidic anthologies, liberal German Protestants had insisted that the allegedly oriental, outdated, and archaic nature of Judaism resulted in the oppression of Jewish women. By and large, in their desperate struggles for citizenship and civil rights in the modern state, German Jewish liberals had insisted that such stereotypes applied only to those vulgar Ostjuden, those Eastern Jews, Eastern European Jews in this case. This sad deflection worked to some extent. As many German Christians and German Jews joined together to throw the Ostjuden, the Eastern European Jews under the bus, so to speak, in the name of liberal progress. Such denigrations of quote, Oriental Judaism intensified toward the end of the 19th century with an influx of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. By 1910, roughly 12% of all Jews in Germany were undocumented Ostjuden, and that number leapt to nearly 20% by 1925. Also, most of these immigrants were men, who, as Carrie Wallach notes, tended to be more recognizable as Jews than their female counterparts, thereby aggravating the anxieties of liberal German Jews who wished to both pass as Protestants and contrast their own bourgeois respectability with an imagined savagery of their Eastern European co-religionists. Now, while acknowledging, of course, the patriarchal structures of rabbinic law and culture, we should also recognize that such liberal condemnations of Jewish tradition echo a most dominant trope of European colonialist discourse. As Saba Mahmoud explains, colonialism rationalized itself on the basis of the inferiority of non-Western cultures, most manifest in their patriarchal customs and practices from which indigenous women had to be rescued through the agency of colonial rule, end quote. Mahmoud applies this lens primarily to Western treatments of Muslims, but it's also certainly relevant to Western treatments of Jews, particularly in the 19th century. At the turn of the 20th century, however, a younger generation of German Jews rejected the, assimila the, the assimilationist aspirations of their parents. If Jews embracing their cultural and spiritual heritage meant jeopardizing their citizenship in the German nation state, then so be it. Buber, a leader of this Jewish counterculture, identified proudly as a Polish Jew he grew out a legendary beard that reportedly made him look like a tzaddik with his Hasidim. And despite anxious pleads from his reformed Jewish father, he published popular books of Hasidic tales. And yet, these anthologies were hardly unapologetic. While his celebration of Ostjuden, of these Eastern European Jews, was inherently subversive given how denigrated they were at the time, Buber nonetheless scrubbed the sources clean of sexist tones that might reinforce negative stereotypes about Jews. He presented a sterilized Hasidic culture. So let's examine this complex territory. On one hand, an intertextual investigation of Buber's writings vis-a-vis -vis the original Hasidic sources reveals Buber's repeated efforts to soften or omit the misogynistic textures of the movement. On the other hand, those very efforts tended to render women even less visible than they were in the original sources. For example, one tale in the Hasidic collection, Siach Sarfei Kodesh, depicts a young Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, who goes on to become a, a, a great Hasidic sage. 
returning to his cantankerous father-in-law's house after a stint away studying with his Rebbe. And I'll share the, the source here. Okay. His father-in-law asked him, so Levi Yitzchak's father-in-law asked him, what did you learn? And Levi Yitzchak responded, I learned that there is in heaven a creator of all the worlds. At this, his father-in-law called out to the maid servant and asked her, do you know that there's a creator of the world? She said, yes. At this, the holy rabbi of Berdicha responded, in truth, she only says it, but I know it. So Levi Yitzchak's father-in-law turns to the maidservant because she is the epitome of an unlearned person, not only as a menial laborer, but also as a woman, as if to say, even she knows that there is a creator. Evidently, Buber bristled at this gendered condescension. For despite the original source's five grammatical indications that the servant is female, his version features a male servant. The classism remains, but the sexism is erased. This is a, just a typical example where Buber alters a source in order to avoid outright misogyny, but in doing so, he strikes women from a scene. In other cases, we see that Buber's discomfort with gender dynamics in Hasidic culture leads him to flatten the personalities of female characters. So let's consider, for example, the following tale in, in Buber's own voice. This tale is called The Dance of the Hasidim, and this is, this is Buber's own, um, own rendition. At the festival of the joy of the teaching, Simcha Torah, the Baal Shem Tov's disciples made merry in his house. They danced and drank and had more and more wine brought up from the cellar. After quite a few hours, the Baal Shem's wife went to his room and said, if they don't stop drinking, we soon won't have any wine left for the Sabbath consecration. He responded laughing, you're right, so go and tell them to stop. When she opened the door to the great room, this is what she saw. The disciples were dancing in a circle and around the dancing circle twined a blazing ring of blue fire. Then she herself took a jug in her right hand and a jug in her left hand, motioning the maidservant away, dashed into the cellar to return as soon as possible with the filled vessels. So in this rendition by Buber, the Besh wife, she is unnamed here, as in the original source, is initially fearful that the Simchat Torah celebration will leave the house without any more wine for an upcoming ritual. A ritual, by the way, that evidently includes her. We soon won't have any wine left for the Sabbath consecration. After her husband instructs her with a laugh to go tell the Hasidim to stop drinking, she enters to behold the sublime sight of the dancing Hasidim. The fiery image not only convinces her to let the Hasidim continue partying, she now feels personally called upon to irrigate this joy, jug after jug, with great alacrity. She, quote, dashed into the cellar to return as soon as possible with the filled vessels. In Buber's imagination, the Baal Shem Tov's wife graduates from fearing the future to delighting in the present. In effect, she becomes the happy housewife, the handmaid of Hasidic ecstasy, inspired to nourish this wondrous community. In retrospect, then, Buber's Besh laugh with his wife was a knowing laugh, intimating that she was in for an enchanting surprise. And for Buber, he did not disappoint. As it turns out, though, the original version of this tale, which Buber drew from the collection Shivche Habesht, is more complicated and actually far more interesting. 
there the Besh wife is more identifiably on the margins of the scene. Whereas in Buber's rendition, she feared that we soon won't have any wine left for upcoming rituals. In the original, she says, they will not leave any wine for the blessing of the Kiddush and Havdalah. And whereas in Buber's tale, she warns that if they don't stop drinking, then we will run out of wine. In Shivchei Habesht, she tells her husband quite pointedly, you tell them to stop drinking and dancing since you will not have any wine left over for the Kiddush and Havdalah. In other words, in the original source, she makes quite clear that this is all her husband's business, not hers. The tale then proceeds more or less the same as in Buber's version. The Besh said to her with a laugh, well said, go tell them to stop and go home. But then when she sees the dancing Hasidim surrounded by fire in the original Hasidic source, she does not dash into the cellar and replenish the wine as soon as possible as she does in Buber's version. Rather, we're told only that she took the pots and she herself went to the cellar and brought them as much wine as they wanted. These unadorned actions raise questions for the reader. Was she awestruck and inspired by the luminous dance of the Hasidim? Or was she just exasperated and overwhelmed? In fact, based on the original tale's ending, which Buber completely omits, the latter interpretation is closer to the truth. The final sentences of the version in Shivchei Habesht read, quote, afterward the Besht asked her, did you tell them to go? And she said to him, you should have told them yourself. Here, she is frustrated with her husband. Why should it fall on me to tell your ever so holy disciples to go home? They're literally surrounded by rings of fire. And by the way, you clearly knew that because you laughed at me when I asked you to intervene. At any rate, why should it fall on me to tell your Hasidim not to drink all the wine so that you and they can enjoy the Sabbath? In this original tale, the sacred sage is also the all too human husband. And here he leaves his disgruntled wife to contain the force field that he's created while he sits back and smiles. Maybe the, eight, the, the late 18th, perhaps early 19th century author of Shivche Habesht thought this tale highlighted the unrecognized valor of the Besh righteous wife. Or perhaps it was to get a laugh, maybe both. In any case, Buber evidently cringed when he saw these marital dynamics. And so he altered the story to make the Besh wife less marginalized and more mesmerized by the community. In so doing though, she is less fierce and more passive. And ultimately the story is no longer even about her. As the title of Buber's own rendition indicates, it is about the dance of the Hasidim, a fraternal effervescence that knocks everyone's socks off regardless of their gender. Moreover, there are countless cases where Buber simply skips over tales in the original sources because women appear mistreated therein. Um, we already saw this in the case of Malka of Belts, where he didn't even note that tale that um, would be such an example. And another prime example of this is Buber's approach to traditional tales about the seer of Lublin's youthful marriage. This is another, um, another very well-known Hasidic Rebbe leader. According to a wealth of sources, the young seer of Lublin perceives something evil either evil or non-Jewish, depending on the telling, in the face of his bride. And his supernatural intuitions are later confirmed when she converts to Christianity. In the meantime, however, the seer had abandoned her to go study for a period of either months or years, depending on the telling, without ever serving her a writ of divorce. So she implicitly then remains an aguna. She remains chained to him, unable to remarry um, or demand any of the resources that he would owe her from the marriage contract. 
Buber was intrigued by this tale. And I'll just, I'll just pull this up here. Another little smoking gun trace here. So Buber was um, intrigued by this tale. And we see here, this is, it's number five here. He records eight different versions of this in his notes on Yaakov Yitzchak of Lublin, the seer of Lublin. And I just wanna highlight, and you can see even with these 71 examples here of thousands of others that this like double line, this two lines that he takes, filling it, just scrunching it with all of these different source examples shows, unlike almost all the other tales that he consults, Buber spent a lot of time on this particular tale, trying to find the right version of it, trying to find some source that wasn't grossly misogynistic and offensive. Um, and we know that he never did find such a version. Um, he scratched that tale entirely from his lengthy chapter on the Seer of Lublin. There is no such tale in his, in his anthologies. Consequently, there is simply no mention of any woman in the seer's life. So just a, a kind of typical example of, of this, um, how these efforts to, to, to soften the misogyny ends up rendering these, these women even less visible, striking them from, from these scenes. In conclusion, when Buber prioritized tales over sermons and earthly events over spiritual sublimations, he thereby subverted hierarchies of gender in Hasidic theology, regardless of his intentions. Furthermore, intertextual studies of Buber's tales reveal that he did struggle with the sexist elements in Hasidic sources. In these very processes though, Buber ended up rendering women and the divine feminine alike even less visible, albeit less explicitly debased. Thus, Buber hardly broke from Hasidic tendencies to treat men and masculinity as the neutral modes of existence. In effect, even when women do appear in his narrative representations of Hasidic relationships, those cameos reflect what Bertha Poppenheim described to her friend Buber as his, quote, somewhat patriarchal, easygoing view of thy neighbor as thyself. And this deficiency in his neo Hasidism may be symptomatic of Buber's dialogical thought more broadly, which, in the words of Mara Benjamin, assumed adult male subjects and thus failed to offer a more full-bodied reckoning with relationality. Alternatively, now looking beyond Buber, many neo-Hasidim have sought to cast women as even more prominent and powerful in early Hasidism than they actually were historically. In her landmark article of 1988, Otto Rappaport Albert lambasted such tendencies, yet they do very much continue today. Now, of course, virtually all movements of spiritual or cultural renewal repaint the past in thick imaginative coats. What influential Renaissance or revolution in human history has not done that? Moreover, when targeted minorities are pressured to defend their cultures or traditions in the face of hegemonic powers, critiques, and interrogations, romanticization of the past is understandable to an extent. In many ways, such were the circumstances of Buber's Hasidic anthologies, all of which he wrote amidst rampant anti-Semitism and the last of which, the magnum opus itself, he completed in Jerusalem as genocidal forces ravaged his former homeland. As a Jew in the United States in 2021, I believe that my relative security and privilege demand a different approach. 
even putting aside academic commitments to historical accuracy for now. I sense that when we distortedly glorify the past, this also threatens to distract us from dynamics of the present. I suspect that contemporary neo-Hasidic communities, for example, who grapple openly with the ethnocentrism and sexism in Hasidic sources will also be more attentive to those issues around and within their very own communities and selves. Panning out a bit in this wonderfully interreligious gathering at the GTU today, I'll conclude here with a question that strikes me as rather urgent in our world. What does it look like to love a tradition or a person, people, land, or institution without, record, without recoiling from full-bodied complexity? Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you so much, Dina and Sam, for your kind words. And thank you, Sam, and the Center for Jewish Studies at GTU for giving me the opportunity to respond to this rich and thought-provoking paper. Of the multiple entry points it offers for reflection and discussion, I will focus on a few aspects of the nexus of embodiment, the feminine and feminism, which is Sam's central theme. <clears throat> First of all, thank you so much, Sam, for your insight that Buber's work was coded feminine by many of his contemporaries. This idea was new to me and it illuminated an important dimension of my graduate school experience. My friend and colleague, Carol Christ, came to Yale, a deep Buber fan, and brought me to an appreciation of his thought. We were given the clear message, however, that Buber was a poet and not a thinker, certainly not someone who should be studied in departmental theology courses and taken seriously. The implication was that anyone attracted to his writing was also not serious and did not really belong at Yale. Whose bodies had a place there? I see this question as connected to Sam's insistence that we must never lose sight of real, lived, aggrandized and marginalized, gendered and racialized bodies whose bodies are present in Buber's Hasidic tales, Sam asks, and whose are absent? How are men and women revealed and concealed in Buber's narratives? Sam argues that Buber's choice to focus on Hasidic tales as opposed to theoretical literature meant that he was embracing a historically feminized genre of his Hasidic work. This choice reflects Buber's broader theology, which situates, situates encounter with the divine in moments of IU meeting or relation. One of the compensations of the pandemic for me has been that it has given me time to begin to study Chabad theology in Hebruta with a study partner. I have spent the last year immersed in the drushes, the sermons and treatises, rather than the mices or tales. And I have been struck as a neophyte by the profound suspicion of and even antipathy toward the body in many Chabad texts. There were moments as I read various Rebbe's descriptions of the connections among bodily lusts that I felt I was back in graduate school reading Augustine. My point is not to argue that this is the real Hasidism. Certainly Chabad theology is deeply paradoxical and often affirms seemingly opposing positions. What interests me is that while suspicion of the body in the texts I've been reading is often couched in general terms, 
it is not difficult to hear reverberating in the background a deep suspicion and fear of women. The fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, for example, the Rebbe Rashab, wrote in his treatise on prayer, composed in 1910, that anyone concerned with the state of purity of his soul, and it always is his, should be careful to protect his sense of eyesight. He says, and I quote, there are people who are far from actually committing any kind of transgression, God forbid, but their hearts pull them to look and to stare. They do so with coldness and detachment, and they feel no excitement at the time they look. But in truth, the underlying reason for their attraction is that the soul is deriving essential enjoyment from bonding with what they are looking at. Our deepest subconscious enjoyment is connected to a corrupt matter, he goes on, and that's the reason for the temptation to stare. Gee whiz, my Hebrew and I wondered, what or whom might Achasid be staring at? A bit later, we learn that if he recklessly contaminates his soul through staring, he will eventually come to a state of actual uncleanness, God forbid. The last Lubavitcher Rebbe, in his commentary on this passage in the Rebbe Rasha, makes the point explicit. He says, reciting the Mishnah, if one saw a woman even without thinking about her, this may lead to seminal omission, as may thinking about her without seeing her. <clears throat> Sam discusses an anecdote about Malka Rakeach, the wife of the first Belserebi, that nicely captures the general stance toward the body in the literature I've been studying. The Rebbe, Sam says, was reported to be at such a high spiritual level Judith, you're on mute. Your computer must have gone to mute. Okay, where did I, uh, I, I go back, I'll go back a sentence. Yeah, at um, such a high level. Uh, okay, uh, the Rebbe was at such a high spiritual level that he felt absolutely no physical sensations in encounters with his wife. This claim aligns perfectly with the idea laid out by the Rebbe Rashab, and I quote, our heart understands that we should want only godliness and we become truly aroused with a will for spirituality. This leads us to leave and forsake all our physical and corporal matters and involve ourselves only with the will and desire for godliness." Unquote. In Chabad texts, a Hasidic master who has <clears throat> attained the highest level of contemplation should be able to strip away the sense of self entirely, losing all conscious awareness. Dover, the second Rebbe and son of the movement's founder, was reportedly able to stand immobile for hours in prayer, insensible to the world around him. Who was wiping his children's noses and changing diapers while he annihilated himself in divinity is not difficult to guess. A central, <clears throat> a central argument in Sam's paper is that Buber's attempts to soften or elide Hasidic misogyny often resulted in his rendering women less visible than they were in the original text. Tales. Sam provides several examples of places that Buber changed the gender of a character or left out a woman entirely, seemingly in order to mitigate the harshness of the view of women in the earlier narratives. I want to sit with and indeed underscore this dis <clears throat> disturbing finding for a moment. It seems that the only way Buber could think to get rid of Hasidic misogyny was to get rid of women. Whatever this says about the limits of Buber's imagination, 
It also brings home the terrifyingly profound sexism, sexism and misogyny that are part of the fabric of major strands of Jewish tradition. There is an intense irony here because of course in leaving out women, Buber was also leaving out the traditional representatives of embodiment. This irony or seeming contradiction leads me to want to hear more about how embodiment is given body in the tales as Buber tells them. Absent women, how does the full bodiness of the tales find expression? Who are the carriers and emissaries of the body in Buber's version of the story? How is Buber's theology of relation given concreteness in the details of the narratives? And what does it say about his broader theology that he could paint a whole world of lively relation while marginalizing women? These questions become all the more urgent because as Sam points out, Buber's anthologies of Hasidic stories inspired sugarcoating tendencies in neo-Hasidism that persist to this day. It is not difficult to think of neo-Hasidic male leaders who teach traditional texts without acknowledging their sexism or who make much of exploring the so-called feminine within themselves but do so in ways that leave little room for the contributions and leadership of actual women. Would grappling with the complex and ambiguous legacy of Hasidism as Sam presents it, better enable us to move toward a Judaism that makes room for a multiplicity of bodies? Would it allow us to develop an embodied theology from which nobody is erased? I believe Sam is absolutely right that addressing the sexism and ethnocentrism in Hasidic sources is a prerequisite for, <clears throat> for addressing these problems as they are manifest today. I am therefore very grateful to Sam for starting to take us down this path. Thank you. <clears throat> um. I'm incredibly moved hearing your response. Uh, moved and, and very, very stimulated as well. Thank you so much, Judith Plasco, for, um, for just thank you for reading the paper, <laughs> but reading it with such care and thoughtfulness and attention and raising such powerful questions and observations, thinking with it in relation to it. Um, I want to pick just a couple pieces where my mind goes in response to your response. Um, one is I just want to highlight what you said that in Buber's myopic imagination, the only way to get rid of misogyny in Hasidism was to get rid of the women. That's such a powerful formulation. Um, and as you said, there's an intense irony there to say the least. Um, and like, that's really, the question that I, that I, I mean, it's the question that I end with. So like the alternative, right, is, um, cause I think that there is a tendency so often and not just now I'm broadening way beyond neo-Hasidism, right? Anyone who wants to engage deeply with any tradition <laughs> has to face this question of like, what do you do with the shadow sides? Like, what do you do with the stuff that, uh, that is offensive, um, that's ugly, that's violent. Um, and so often it's, we seem to be presented with this binary option of, well, you either, you know, sugarcoat and do a selective reading of the tradition and sing and dance with it and love it and say it's, you know, the best thing ever and it's divine revelation, or you just, say like this is this is a disgusting violent tradition i certainly understand i understand the latter more than the former <laughs> honestly like that's that feels more honest to me but for those of us who do like draw inspiration and um 
and see light within these imperfect, like messy traditions. What do we do? And I think there are very few examples. And I think your work actually is one very helpful example. I have to like slap my wrist from just teaching this one essay of yours from Tikkun that, pre that predated standing again at Sinai, like in every course I teach, because I think you show, and you show again also in standing again at Sinai of this approach where you begin with what's disturbing, right? You look straight in the eye of what is repulsive um, and heartbreaking in, in, in this tradition. Um, and then also recognize a difference between history and memory, right? And say that like we do, that one who is engaged with a tradition um, and wants to be inside it can engage in that imaginative constructive process of remembering um, that which maybe isn't there or was suppressed um, or taken out um, as a way to, to be constructive in the present while again, not overlooking or omitting that which is hard. And um, I would love to see more of that in, in the world of neo-Hasidism and really in just in religious life in general and something that I, I'm trying to cultivate myself because I think it's a hard tension to hold, but it's incredibly important. Um, and in terms of your question about how is embodiment uh, embodied in Buber's tales, um, I will keep my comments brief because that's like this whole book project in many ways, but just as one example that I think is, is illuminating. Um, so for example, there's a, there's a traditional tale about the first meeting between the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid of Mezrich. And according to the original sources, um, there's this, the, the Magid of Mezrich at first is this like kind of excessively sort of intellectualist, bookish, heady uh, scholar who hears the reputation of the Baal Shem Tov and he's like, let me go check this guy out and see what everyone's raving about. But he's like frustrated because the journey is taking too long. It's keeping him from his studies. And, and eventually he has this encounter with the Baal Shem Tov and the, and the Besht is just telling him like these random, seemingly like inane random stories about human interactions with wagon drivers on the road and like giving bread to a poor person. And, and the Magid's like, get on with it. I wanna hear the Torah, right? And in the original tale, there's then this climactic transformative moment where the Besht shows the Magid that indeed you do know a lot. You, do, you have indeed studied a lot, but your study has no soul. And the way that the Besht in the original sources conveys that to the Magid is by engaging in this like meditative, contemplative practice in relation to the letters of Sefer Eitz Chaim, a Kabbalistic text that they're holding together. And, and, and actually has the Magid, essentially catalyzes like this out of body experience for the Magid as according to some tellings, the Magid is even curled up like on a bed. But in Buber's version, he tweaks the ending of the story to make the transformative moment one where the, the Besht says to the Magid, like stand in front of me, <laughs> right? And they're standing over against each other. And, the, and according to Buber, at the beginning of the story, the Magid hadn't even been looking at him. Buber like adds that detail. But then at the end, there's this moment where they're standing face to face. The Besht, again, still reads from Eitz Chaim, but it's clearly for Buber, like in the Besht, basically grabbing the Magid and saying, like, look at me. Like Torah is right here. <laughs> you know, you're, look, you're looking in the wrong, you're looking in the wrong direction. This is Buber's with like relatively subtle changes, just completely transforms the meaning of what is so revelatory. And that's like one example of how Buber takes, um, on one hand, just changes the meaning of the story, one that had emphasized sort of spiritualization now emphasizes embodied presence. But at the same time, Buber's reading is sort of possible with the original text. And that's what I think is like so fascinating. Like he's, 
he's on, on, on another level, he is like perhaps picking up on something that was in that original source that, that maybe got lost or covered over in the sort of myst mystical ecstasy of, of, of Hasidic memory. And he's remembering it differently. Um, so a couple, a couple of responses, but thank you. I'm so grateful for, for, your, for your comments. Thank you to Sam and Judith. I, we have just a little bit of time for some of the questions that have been posted. Uh, we have a very esteemed gathering here, um, including uh, Professor David Beal, who in many ways in the uh, early years of the Center for Jewish Studies really made it what it is today. Uh, welcome, David. And David asked a question that I think will tie together, Sam, so many of the threads in your piece, but taking it in an interesting direction. Uh, David points out that in 1911, Buber wrote an essay entitled The Zion of the Jewish Woman. In that piece, he denounces bourgeois German Jewish women for their materialism. And very much in keeping with the romanticization, Sam, that you've been picking up on, Buber contrasts them with what he renders as the modest traditional Jewish women, presumably of the East. Um, and then add another vector into this. In the Zionist movement, argues Buber, women are called up to return to the traditional ideal. Uh, I myself have not read this piece by Buber, but David is wondering how might this view cast light on how Buber is rendering women or as you said, uh, concealing and revealing uh, at the same time. Hi, David. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And yeah, I, I have read that essay along with um, Paula Winkler, Buber's sort of related writings on the woman and Zionism, Buber's wife. And they actually clearly, like, at least in those early years, um, had, had pretty similar portrayals of the role of the woman in, in Zionism. And um, yeah, to, to think with your question a bit, you know, it's interesting. When Buber talks about the sort of bourgeois materialism of modernity, um, it's easy to then conclude from that, that what he's going for is a kind of spiritual abstraction in contrast to that sort of capitalist liberal materialism. Um, and at times in those years, I mean, when he wrote that essay, he was still in his so-called mystical years. So perhaps there was some of that, but it, at least in shortly thereafter in his, in his dialogical years, which is the phase of his life uh, um, in which he wrote the Hasidic tales that my work is focusing on. Um, in a way, Buber saw the the sort of attachment to material security and comfort um, that he identified and so many other contemporaries of his kind of identified with, um, with that modern condition. Ironically, had he, he comes to see that as having this kind of disembodying effect, perhaps ironically, that um, it's actually when we, for Buber, um, when we let go of uh, the need to always sort of like have things and possess things ourselves and be comfortable and in a state of sort of like uh, overcoming distress ourselves, when we let go of that, we can actually open our eyes in new ways to see other beings in the world, which is for Buber a, a deeper dimension of embodiment, I would say that ironically in some ways, I it existence in as much as it's so sort of fixated on, on, um, on materiality is in some ways actually less embodied, less lively to use Buber's term, um, bodily relational than, than I thou existence. And so in terms of um, his, his reflections on women and Zionism in that particular essay, and it's been a couple of years, um, you know, Buber's Zionism, and as, as you showed in your, in your article on Zionism as an erotic revolution, I mean, Buber was very much in that discourse of seeing cultural Zionism as a kind of re-inhabiting 
of earthliness and of bodiliness. And that is, there is a deep correlation between that and his Hasidic writings. Um, and it's in, it is interesting that he, um, so when he contrasts that sort of modern materialistic uh, alienation from what he's casting as this like authentic Jewish woman, um, which Paula also does, um, he's also nonetheless talking about how uh, Jewish women are going to be somehow like the, the very like beating heart of reconnecting with with land, <laughs> um, and we could we could go off on this for a, for a while, and it, it, this is this is complex territory. Uh, I think that actually ends up being a pretty good example of how Buber um, sort of continues to maintain and propagate this association between femininity and corporeality in his Zionist writings, in his Hasidic writings. Um, so we see in some ways that he never really lets go of that. Um, ex but when he, but he clearly feels this need when he sees that happening in overt ways in the Hasidic sources, perhaps just because of, uh, for a variety of historical cultural reasons, he, he tries to downplay that element. Sam, we have time for one last quick question, and this one will direct us uh, forward a bit. Um, one of our CJS students, uh, Jonah Gelfand, is asking, what do you suggest for modern neo-Hasidic communities in light of your insights? Mm -hmm. um, communities that in many ways have embraced the tales, which as Judith Plaskow um, reminded us, it coded um, and marked as feminine. Um, is that the way to go? Uh, should they supplement with drashot? Does historical contextualization and the confrontation with the disturbing aspects of the material, again, as Judith remarked and has modeled for us, is that the modality? Um, some thoughts for practitioners. Mm. Thank you for that most important question, Jonah. Um, This is where I really don't buy the idea that academic religious studies is divorced from communal spiritual religious life, <laughs> right? Like what I, what I think would be beautiful and important and healing in neo-Hasidism today um, is deeper engagement with the sources. Right, like actually, let's 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 study these texts. Whether we're looking at the tales or the drasho, the sermons, um, perhaps reading some some secondary literature, like let's like reading some essays, articles, books about Hasidism, understanding that culture, that history. Um, can I, I do? I mean, I, I Jonah and I are doing a special reading course where we're reading the or a naim, uh, one of the great texts of, um, of, of early Hasidism. And I feel like we're doing it. <laughs> I feel like um, what I envision is, um, is being, letting ourselves be inspired and awestruck by the beautiful, by the beautiful streams in these sources um, and, and take what we can and what, what what um what we find radiant in in the history in the community and also in that process be really honest and and critical um when we come upon those things that are gross <laughs> or that are violent um or that 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 um clash with our sensibilities and i think that uh i would like to see contemporary uh neo-hasidic theology and, and forms of community and culture and life that do that process openly and explicitly and transparently, right? And, and, and to not fall into that binary of either demonizing or emphasizing, but to actually have a, a full body as Mara Benjamin in, in, in her language there, right? To have that, that full bodied relationality um, with, with Hasidic sources, um, and to, to channel that effervescence while also, um, being responsible. 
Um, thank you, Sam Shankoff, uh, Judith Plaskow, for your contributions. For all of us who are here, I know that we're now taking away so much. Uh, thank you, Uriah Kim, for your welcome and your presence. And Shana Penn and Toby Philanthropies, thank you uh, for your support and, um, and, and trust that, as Sam just said, that the world of ideas and academic critical inquiry has a major role to play in uh, communal and broader civic uh, formations. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.